Blog Talk Radio. Hello? Hmm. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hello? Fitz? Hi, Fitz. Hi. Yes. How are you? <laughs> How are I you? I am still kept calls. I'm wonderful. Thank you. I kept having a very weird response when I called. I'm so happy you said hello. Hello. Yes, I apologize. I, I was sitting. I have a little goof up, so I have my mute on. So I apologize for that. But the show is on, and um, we are not. We're live in a way, but we're really just speaking to each other. And then, um, we'll, okay, we'll, I'll tell you the rest later. But I, I uh, already did speak on um, what the title of the show is, which is how to face adversity with grace. And then um, nice. may I ask how you pronounced your last name? It's Kohler. It's so Kohler. It's Fit. F I T. Kohler. Kohler. And my business is Fitness. Fitness. Yes, I saw it. it's uh, outstanding. Fitz Kohler. I would have her here. Kohler. She is amazing, everyone. Kohler. Kohler. Is that correct? Kohler. Yes. Um, Kohler. <laughs> but okay. I did. Kohler. Oh, I'm sorry. How am I saying it? Kohler. Kohl, like coal. Kohler. Yeah. Uh-huh. Kohler. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. how it sounds like I'm I hope I'm not mispronouncing. I apologize if I am. Um, but I want to go ahead and move forward with our interview. And one of my first questions is, how can a cancer patient slow their physical decline? Well, you got to put in some effort. And I, I tell you what, if if you were smart enough to take care of your health and pursue fitness before cancer, then you could pat yourself on the back because, in general, you know, a fitter person will be far more likely to rebound, recover, stay strong if you had already put in an effort, you know, more so than an unfit person. But, yeah, when you get a diagnosis, and I ha- have had a diagnosis, so I've been there, done that, it is really important that you start controlling the things that you can. And, you know, you control the doctors that you choose Mm -hmm. and you agree to the treatment or not. Uh, But every day Mm -hmm. you put an effort to be stronger and more flexible and have better endurance and work on your balance and and choose foods that help versus foods that hurt. And then as even as treatment starts beating you up and uh, inevitably at some point it will, you do what you can to preserve the fitness that you have. And so uh, the rule of thumb is if you can't stand, do exercises sitting. If you can't do exercises sitting, do them lying in bed. If you are sick as a dog and can't do anything, at minimal, at minimum, stretch. Stretch in bed, stretch in the shower. And so those things will keep you from a full backslide into, you know, a really bad place. They will keep you you know, as good as possible, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, and then um, what was the most surprising about your cancer treatment? Uh, you know, there was a lot of surprising components. Uh, some of them were really, really funny. So I, I didn't really know what to expect. I was healthy and strong and athletic when I went into cancer care, so I was hoping that, I would fare better than the rest. Unfortunately, they gave me some really mean chemo for 15 months, and I had surgeries and radiation, which all took its toll. But I think some of the things that were really surprising were the things that nobody talked about. And so, um, you know, I had started off with a terribly runny nose after I started chemo, and I just thought, oh, I'm alert. I have allergies, blah, blah, blah. Well, I didn't have allergies. I lost my nostril hair. And so, yes, I went bald on my head. And people will talk about losing the hair on your legs and how lovely it is not to have to shave for however long. But nobody told me I was going to lose my nostril hair. And so when the nostril hair fell out and my nose became this 
faucet running all the time. I thought that was kind of surprising. My eyes changed colors. Uh, my vision uh, went downhill. There was all sorts of bizarro experiences. And, you know, again, nobody talks about that, which is why I very specifically did talk about the weird stuff in my noisy cancer comeback and then in these next two books too because, you know, it, it helps when, you know, somebody else is in this weird, wacky boat with you. Yes. And then um, um, I think, yes, uh, what was it like standing on stages bald or great? Bald and gray? Yeah, bald and gray. So uh, I'm a professional race announcer, which means I am on the stages. I uh, host the start and finish lines of some of the largest, most iconic running events in the United States, Los Angeles Marathon, Big Sur, Buffalo Marathon, Detroit Free Press. And so my job is to welcome thousands of athletes as they show up to go the distance, get them engaged, informed, entertained. I yell go, and I send them off to do their race and then they come home through the finish line and I welcome them with great fanfare but yeah I uh I never hid I never wore a wig I'd wear a hat on a cold day but I just decided that bald is was my lot in life and uh it is it was going to be what it was going to be but it was it was interesting because on a cold day if I took my hat off man the crowds would hush people would look at me and and all of a sudden it was oh she she does she have cancer? You know, they were so surprised by it. Um, but but my hair doesn't define me. My appearance has never defined me. And, you know, again, instead of hiding from my situation, what I did is I used it to compel people to get their annual exams, squeeze their stuff. You know, you can't just go in for the annual exams and call it a day. You have to keep an eye on your own body and uh, hopefully do a little bit of role modeling for future cancer patients who are going to lose their hair and let them know that, you know, if you want to wear a wig and that works for you and makes you happy, fine. But if you find them itchy like I did and you, they make you sad like they did me, you don't have to. Yeah. And then um, I have a, a question. How, um, how was it when you received your diagnosis from your doctor and also what were, what were the symptoms? Yeah, so I actually, well, I, I wasn't symptom-free. In December of 2018, I had a sparkling clean mammogram. And less than seven weeks later, I was at a race weekend, and I came out of the shower, and I scratched my under boob, and I found a lump. And so that was it. That was my only symptoms. I found a lump. It felt like a black bean, you know, like a little bean in my boob. And I thought, oh, no. And I instantly called the doctor. I picked up the phone naked in that bathroom. And I called, uh, ironically, cancer itself, thankfully, because it hadn't spread or or too far. It had already spread to the lymph nodes. But I I didn't have symptoms of cancer never made me sick. My treatment made me very, very sick. Um, But other than that lump, cancer didn't cause too much. Uh, The treatment caused a lot of harm. But I'm I'm healthy now, which is all that matters. Right. And then why did you write My Noisy Cancer Comeback, Running at the Mouth While Running for My Life? You know, I wrote that book first because I thought some of the my experiences were very funny. You know, I just thought, oh, people would get a good laugh at this because I, I wasn't staying home in bed the whole time. I boarded about 30 flights out of Gainesville, Florida to go do my work and uh, shenanigans and hijinks ensued. It was wild. Um, But the other reason I wrote the book is because I thought, you know, I can help people. I've made an entire career out of helping people do better and be better. And, you know, I made some decisions at the start of my treatment that really went a long way. First, first being key perspective. You know, for me, I was very grateful that it wasn't my kid. um, And I wasn't a kid going through cancer care. So I was a grown-up, and I could handle it. So while I cried every day, I never had a pity party. Um, I chose to continue pursuing passions. I I think it's scary that so many people, whether they have COVID or or cancer or whatever, they just hide inside their house. Um, my life was made uh, so much better. My recovery, my mental uh, health was so much better because I continued pursuing my passions. 
And then last but not least, I chose to be positive. It doesn't, you don't get any extra points for having a pity party. So I, you know, I, I made the best of my days and that really got me through it. And so I share a lot of that in my noisy cancer comeback. And I can't tell you how many uh, readers have reached out to say that after they read my book, they started living better and enjoying life a lot more, even during cancer treatment, because they just hadn't even considered having a good time and having a nice life during the process. Thank you. And then what was the secret to returning to normal or high levels of fitness after after cancer care? Yeah, you know, the secret is, and I include that in these new books, Your Healthy Cancer Comeback, Sick to Strong, and its companion, Healthy Cancer Comeback Journal. Um, but the secret is, is to systematically make efforts to gain strength, stamina, uh, flexibility, balance, to work on your nutrition. You have to be deliberate about your health. So if you control what you can and, and take baby steps, say this is not the time to, you know, focus on being an Ironman champion. This is a time for you to be first off very compassionate with yourself because cancer care is really, really difficult. Um, but, Make those baby steps. You know, if your baby step is just you're going to walk down the hall in the hospital after surgery, do it. If you're going to do some dancing in your chair, do it. But constantly push the envelope a teeny little bit at the time, at a time, and eventually you'll get back to A, where you were before cancer, and then B, hopefully with your new respect for health and, you know, being unleashed to live your life longer like to just live your life hopefully you will pursue athletic adventure and become healthier and fitter than you've ever been before wonderful and then um when you are returning to normal what was when you were what was the uh, span of time like how long did it take oh, that's a good question so i did have 15 months of chemo which it just kept beating me down, 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 and I had lost a ton of weight. I was skeletal. I was so thin and so weak I couldn't even open a water bottle. Um, but I, I <laughs> made baby steps during the latter half of my treatment when it got a little easier. And I think it took for me to get all the way back to normal a little over a year. So may, maybe it was 15 months of treatment, and it took me 15 months to get back to um, being as strong as I was before. And ironically, about 15 months after I finished treatment, I ran the Boston Marathon. So, um, wow. you know, I was I was, I was in wow. the worst shape ever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we can all do hard things. We, there's a lot of people conquering much more than I did, but our, our, the human body is fantastic. And if we, if we have the knowledge, and then we have the discipline and determination. Uh, boy, we can we can really achieve so much. So I, I hope there's no cancer patients or survivors out there really feeling like they're doomed to just be weak. Uh, for the most of us, uh, remission is possible and health is really possible. You just you got to put forth the effort, and I hope I can help. Thank you so much. And then, um, what's the craziest thing you've ever seen at an event? Oh, gosh. Uh, so it's interesting to me. I, I announce races that are one mile in length, 5K half marathon, which is 13.1, and then 26.2 miles, which is a really long way to go. And most people are dressing for function. They want to have the perfect shoes and the perfect shorts and the tank top that won't allow that won't make them chafe. Man, sometimes I see people show up and run a marathon dressed as Big Bird in a full blown Big Bird costume or <laughs> dressed as French fries. It's just crazy and all I look and see is, holy mackerel, that must be hot and they must be chafing. That's gotta be so uncomfortable. But people are fun and they are funny and yeah, every single time I host one of these major events, I see some wacky person that goes the distance dressed like a lunatic, and they make us all happy. You know, it's just so fun to have those people around. So, yeah, the human spirit is incredible. So what 
is the most exciting thing about being a race announcer? You know what? Um, there's two things. Is a, as a fitness expert, I spend so much time twisting people's arms, trying to convince them to be healthy and fit. But on race day, I show up at a start line, and some race organization has already found and they provide me with 15,000 people that have already decided that exercise is a great idea. So at the start line, Mm -hmm. I don't have any arm twisting. I am just there to welcome people, make them feel, you know, calm their nerves, get them excited. So that is a, a true privilege to welcome these wonderful people who care about their health, their great, their communities, great causes. But then I am also the very first person out of everybody in the world that gets to welcome them finish line. I'm the first one to give them an attaboy or an atta girl and tell them how how wonderful they are. And I do it with great enthusiasm, whether it's the first finisher or the dead last finisher. And uh, it's my dream come true where society takes care of their health. So I love it. It's just, it's a privilege. Mm-hmm. They're, they're so happy. They sometimes they're tears of joy, but it's uh, the I think the best people on planet earth show up at my races because they're, they're just so good and they try so hard and very few of them look like a runner. You know, they look like anyone who Mm -hmm. lives on your block, anyone you've ever seen at Walmart or the grocery store. I have people in their nineties running full marathons. I have pregnant women. Mm -hmm. I have uh, world war II veterans. I have, I have men with no legs, zero legs running full marathons. So uh, Mm -hmm. it's, just extraordinary. Sounds like that's so inspiring. And then mm-hmm. um, can health and fitness can health and fitness impact remission and recurrence rates? Yeah, in fact, that is one of the top reasons to pursue fitness and um, quality nutrition during your care. So there is documented food that helps. And I I go through that in your healthy cancer comeback. And then there is evidence that exercise uh, will help fight cancer and limit its ability to spread and grow. In fact, there was just a read Tel Aviv talking about um, how exercise, endurance exercises uh, could prevent the spread of cancer, which is phenomenal. So, so yeah, that will that will increase your chances of remission. So not only can you use those those Western medicine drugs, the chemo and the surgery and the radiation, I, I'm definitely pro that stuff. But you can also do things to help your case along. What can you do to fight fire with fire? You can uh, exercise and eat right, and these are things that have no negative consequences. As well, studies show that if you eat wisely and you get good sleep and you don't drink alcohol and you avoid processed foods and you exercise, your cancer is far less likely to come back. And so, um, yeah, it's a proven science that quality nutrition and exercise can help you live longer in spite of cancer. And then, um, oh, okay, so where can people find you and buy your book? Well, that's a great question. So my books are sold wherever (laughs) books are sold. However, I prefer it when they come to my website, fitzness.com. So my name is Fitz, F-I-T-Z, and my website is F-I-T-Z, N as in Nancy, E-S-S dot com. And if you buy the books there, uh, the Healthy Cancer Comeback and the journal are on pre-sale right now. Noise is already available, but all three books will be sent out signed. If you purchase them at fitzness.com, there's a discount for the three-pack and the two-pack, and every book that leaves my office is signed before it's sent out. And Noisy comes with a free gift. So um, we try to incentivize everybody to shop local, and fitness.com is the place to do that. Excellent. And last but not least, I was curious about your support system. What type of support system have you had Um through your healing and your your um, cancer crushing journey. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So I'm very fortunate. My family stepped up big time. My husband took me to every appointment and he got me every drink and made sure I didn't fall down when I was weak. I have such great care at home. My 
my I had my young teenagers when I was diagnosed and our friends and neighbors stepped up to the plate to drive them. You know, that was that was really important to me that they have a safe ride to and from school and activities and I just wasn't in shape to be able to do that a lot. So that helped a lot. Uh, I, we had the meal train, people drop off food, my runners, every time I'd show up to an event weekend while I was sick, they brought uh, drinks and snacks and blankets and umbrellas, and God forbid it was raining or cold, they came with extra resources to try to protect me from those elements. And last but not least, as I traveled this beautiful country, bald, and obviously, you know, I I really was kind of the poster child for cancer. I never wore a a ribbon, a pink ribbon. I never wore one of those I have cancer shirts. I just dressed like a normal person, but people knew, and strangers did everything they could to, uh, to just show concern for me or help me, whether they were taking my luggage out of the the overhead bins on the plane or, you know, giving me a snack or just coming over to tell me, hey, I'm rooting for you. Uh, Sometimes people pick on Americans, and I think they are dead wrong because we have the kindest, most generous group of humans on this, uh, on, on this, in this country that, that are known to man. I'm so fortunate. It was, it was a real blessing. And I will spend the rest of my days trying to pay it forward and extend that kindness to others who need it. That was a wonderful way to end our show. I want to thank you so, so very much. Um, just absolutely honored to have you as my guest. And um, I just want to thank you, thank you, thank you again. <laughs> and um, I have to say bye for now because uh, we only have two minutes left of the show. But you're absolutely awe-inspiring and I just can't wait until people listen to this show in particular. Um, Thank you so much, Fitz. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Okay. I only have 60 seconds left of the show. So what I want to do is re- um, we introduce our guest or just really talk about her. Um, as you, you, we just heard from her. She's amazing. Um, I can't even believe I was so fortunate to, to have her on. But her name is Fitz Kohler, and she is one of the most prominent and compelling fitness experts and race announcers in America. As the voice of the Los Angeles Marathon, Philadelphia Marathon, Big Sur Marathon, DC, Wonder Woman Run Series, and more. She brings big structure, energy, and joy to the sport. She's she's passionate about guiding others to live better and longer through her company, FITS, spelled F-I-T-Z-N-E-S-S. She's appeared on national media outlets and work with corporations like Disney, Tropicana, Oakley, and Office Depot. Fitz has also inspired millions of kids to get active through her successful school running or walking program, The Morning Mile. I want to send you, my audience, to her magnificent website. It is www.zness.com. Okay, and if you have any questions or comments, you can send it here to the show, Coffee Chat with Camille, or to our new website, coffeechatwithcamille.com. Okay, thank you so much, listeners, and I hope that you learned as much as I did. And um, please make sure you go and check out um, Fitz's, Fitz, <laughs> Fitz um, website, okay? Thank you so much, everyone. Bye for now.